Professor Umberto Terrones here, uh, who's going to talk about electronic uh, properties, uh, vibrational properties, optical properties of 2D materials. So with that, uh, please take it away, Professor Terrones. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Git and Professor Manier for this uh, invitation to talk about uh, um, the results of my group um, uh, related to two-dimensional materials. Uh, in this talk, I will show in general what we can achieve. I will not do specifics on every result because there are several results, but you can ask uh, about it. So my idea in this talk is to show the exciting field of uh, what we called uh, two-dimensional materials. Uh, the outline of my talk will be first to um, mention what is a two-dimensional material. Then we will mention, uh, I will mention several two-dimensional materials and some of uh, their properties, electronic properties. I will, then I will talk about the geometry uh, because once we have a two-dimensional material, I think it is worth uh, talking about uh, other structures that we can achieve. And here, I would like to introduce the concept of curvature. Because once we have a layer or some of something, we can bend this layer to have uh, another structure, another layer, uh, which exhibits curvature, which may have interesting electronic, vibrational, and optical properties. Uh, I will switch gears to talk about vibrational properties, because vibrational properties uh, can be calculated, and we can uh, relate these calculations to experimental, sorry, to theoretical, um, sorry, experimental uh, findings. So uh, we can do a kind of a theoretical spectroscopy. And the agreement is quite good at the level of DFT, density functional theory. Then I will talk briefly uh, I'm not sure if I will have time to talk uh, too much about optical properties uh, because some of these two-dimensional material exhibit uh, interesting linear and nonlinear optical properties, which also can be calculated. However, here we have to go beyond uh, DFT, beyond density functional theory, because if we want to uh, study properly these uh, one of these two one of these types of two dimensional materials uh, we have to uh, include excitons which is a bound state of a, a, an electron hole and an, an electron and a hole it's an electron hole pair and DFT cannot really describe a two particle system like an electron and a hole, then we have to do other approaches. And then I will conclude uh, my, my talk. Okay, let's start. Uh, I always like to start when I talk about two dimensional materials uh, with a quote by Richard Feynman, which I believe everybody knows. In this very famous lecture he gave in 1959, there is plenty of room at the bottom. And he said, 
what could we do with layer structures with just the right layers? What would the properties of materials be if we could really arrange the atoms in the way we want them? I can hardly doubt that when we have some control of the arrangement of things on a small scale, we will get an enormously greater range of possible properties that substances can have. So uh, somehow, uh, Richard Feynman in 1959 uh, envisaged, envisaged the properties of uh, layered structures. Uh, in fact, Richard Feynman is considered one of the uh, fathers of uh, nanotechnology. OK, the concept of 2D material and the structure of 2D materials. It is very important that 2D materials have different structures, and we can change this structure. And if we change the structure, uh, electronic properties are going to change, geometrical properties are going to change, vibrational properties are going to change, optical properties are going to change. OK. Do 2D materials exist? Well, strictly speaking, no, if we just consider two dimensions. Why? Because atoms exhibit a volume in three dimensions and also exhibit a, a thickness. So the concept of two dimensional materials comes because the atoms can be arranged in sheets, two-dimensional sheets, or quasi-two-dimensional sheets embedded in a three-dimensional space. And we can just look at a case. For example, if we have a graphene flake of 10 microns in length, and we divide the thickness by the surface one half um, so what we have is this number which is very small so the thickness is smaller compared to the surface and this is this can be considered a two-dimensional material in the case of a graphene which is just one layer of graphite because graphite is arranged in layers i will explain that um, which is very easy to obtain these layers but it is not easy to measure properties so we can consider that a material that has is very thin compared to its length or surface then can be considered a two-dimensional material Another important point for two-dimensional materials is that the layers are stacked. And the interaction of these layers is called Van der Waals interaction. In fact, is a very weak interaction. Very weak, I mean, there is no chemical bond. So that's why it's very easy to obtain the layers. I will talk perhaps later about this scotch tape method and mechanical exfoliation. OK. And of course, if we manage to get one layer of this uh, structure that has very many layers, we have a two-dimensional material. Usually, the materials that we find in nature are materials that have a, several layers, very, very many, hundreds of thousands, millions, billions of layers. So we have to work with just one. And the technology, and considering um, methods for characterizing these materials and considering also uh, a computing infrastructure 
is just right at this time we are living to use them for several applications. This is graphite, which I believe everybody has uh, at least ha has used graphite to write. Uh, because when you use a pencil, uh, you use a graphite lead, and the graphite as a material is made of these layers we have here. You have three layers, which are separated by 3.35 angstroms. Uh, there is no chemical bond. So it is very easy to separate them, sort of easy. Um, so what you write with is graphite. And if you just isolate one of these layers, you get what is it is called graphene. And I have put here graphene, I have put Euclidean geometry because if you write or you draw a triangle here on this surface, uh, the interior angles of the triangle would, would, would be 180 uh, degrees. If you cut graphene in, and you generate a triangle, assuming that you have the tool to cut it, then uh, the interior angles of the triangle will add 180 degrees. And this is the world of Euclidean geometry. I will talk a little bit about the geometry because once we have a one of these monolayers, we should be able to introduce a curvature and then we will be able to leave Euclidean geometry and visit the two other geometries that we have in four surfaces in three dimensions. Okay, so two-dimensional materials, I could say, is not new. Uh, people have been working with graphite, and I will show, uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, history. And uh, there are several and are known since long time ago, I could say since 1917. Uh, people knew through electron diffraction and X-ray powder diffraction. In fact, the first results were obtained by X-ray powder diffraction. They People knew that this graphite was made of layers, and then uh, people started to study these layer materials and realized that the layers were very easy. You could uh, get one layer. And this is not new. What it is new is that now we have the tools to um, make devices to measure properties. And that's why it, this is very exciting. Um, so here I show in this graph that we can have a these two-dimensional materials can have different electronic behavior. They can be insulators. Uh, they can be semiconductors. We have semiconductors. Uh, some of them can be superconductors, um, like this one. And it also can be a, a semi-metals which I don't have here, but graphene is a semi-metal, so is a conductor. So I have a list of some of, there are thousands of these two-dimensional materials. Also, uh, I'm talking about monolayers, but the crystal associated, that means once you have lots of layers, millions or billions of layers, then you have a crystal that leaves in three dimension, and some of the some of these crystals can be found found in nature. Others sometimes we need to synthesize them to have nice nice layers because one of the 
problems we are dealing now is that these materials may have defects. And if you have a defect in your monolayer, uh, then this may change greatly the electronic properties. That's something very interesting. And I will show a little bit about defects and the role defects may play in the context of a changing curvature. So I will go quickly, the structure of graphite, a first um, experiment to elucidate the structure of graphite were carried out by uh, using X-ray uh, diffraction in 1917 by Albert Wallace Hall, American scientist, and in the same year by Peter Debye and Paul Scherer. And they found that graphite was made of layers. At that time, the problem was not the structure of each layer. They knew that the structure was a like the one we have here. Every atom, every vertex is connected to other three atoms and forming an hexagonal mesh or a honeycomb. So they knew that. At that time, the problem was the stacking, how these layers were uh, arranged. And it turns out that they had a different sample of graphite. And John, Des John Desmond Bernal, at the age of 23 years old, uh, he was born in 1901, uh, he found he had a very nice crystal and he used a, a, a monocrystal X-ray diffraction. And what he found is that uh, the stacking of the layers in graphite is a type that is called AD, AD stacking. That means the first layer is the same as the exactly in the same position as the third layer, but this one is shifted in a way that the vertex here coincides with a, a the center of a hexagon in the second layer. This is not the best uh, drawing, but this is the drawing that had this publication of Bernal. So uh, I have to mention Rosalind Franklin. He did really a very good job working with uh, graphitic carbons. Um, I what he what she was uh, working with, which is really very interesting. This is related to the stacking, is to see which organic materials, when you carbonize them, uh, you get you. When you burn this organic material, what you get is a carbon. You get a carbon black, black stuff. And what she wanted to, what she was studying was if the uh, stacking of the layers was the same as the stacking that um, Bernal predicted or had a different stacking. And she found that graphite or a carbon material can have different stackings and in fact can have a random stacking, which this is called turbostratic. So of course, now our problem is not the stacking. What we are not interested in to stack at some point because I will mention that we have two layers. The stacking is important. I will mention this later on because you can have a in bilayer graphene, you can have a superconducting behavior. So, but nowadays the interesting properties of a graphene comes from when, when you have one layer. I will, uh, so this is one uh, um, 
of the two-dimensional materials, perhaps the first one and uh, the easiest one. Um, I will mention later about the, uh, the, uh, the properties, but let's talk about other two-dimensional materials. This is a material called transition metal dichalcogenide. And transition metal dichalcogenides are layers, but in this case, the layer is not just one atom thick, it has three atoms. Sulfur, a transition metal that can be molybdenum, tungsten, niobium, um, and the calcogen atom can be sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. So we have these three, three atoms, this layer uh, composed of three atoms. And uh, we also, this is just uh, interesting to see that if we observe from a from the top, one of these layers looks like graphene because we have sort of honeycomb, a, a hexagonal structure. These uh, transition metals like alcogenides, these TMDs, which can be like molybdenum disulfide, tungsten disulfide, molybdenum diselenide, and tungsten diselenide, all these are semiconductors, which this is very good because graphene is a semi-metal. And we talk a, about uh, a little bit about this. And being a semi-metal, something that conducts electricity, uh, not very good, but conducts electricity, uh, is not good for devices. Though the electrons in graphene, they behave in a different way from graphite, because the electrons, I will mention this later, be behave in a special way. But the interesting thing about these these other two, these uh, two-dimensional materials is that there are semiconductors and they possess a direct band gap. Direct band gap is good for optical properties. So you excite your material with a photons that may come from a um, laser and you may get a response from your material that may be important. Um, so, we have semiconductors, uh, we have uh, these two are metals, niobium disulfide and niobium diselenide. They share the same structure, same structure that we have, except that the transition metal is uh, niobium, and you can have niobium sulfide or niobium selenide, and interestingly, these even in the monolayer are superconductors, which is also interesting. Uh, another point that uh, people really uh, is not studying very much now are just uh, some papers about it. In my opinion, there are uh, very exciting results is that we can have two phases of molybdenum sulfide, tungsten sulfide, molybdenum selenide or diselenide, tungsten diselenide. One which is the semiconducting phase called trigonal prismatic. And the other one is the octahedral phase. Interestingly, the octahedral phase, you can see that here we have a, 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 tri, a trigonal prism. That's why it's called trigonal prismatic. Here we have a trigonal prism. And here, what we have is an octahedron. So that's why it's called octahedral phase. And space groups are different, the structure is different. And it turns out that when you have your molybdenum sulfide, toxin sulfide, molybdenum diselenide, toxin diselenide, in the octahedral phase, your system now becomes metallic. And interestingly, you can go from this phase to this phase. Sorry, it's on the, on the, other, the other way. You can go from this phase 
to this phase. And then you cannot go back because this is more stable. So this is interesting, these two structures are with the same composition. Okay. So this is a structure. I have focus on these, these transition metal dichalcogenized TMDs and in graphene. Uh, these are good examples. There are others and also very interesting. Uh, people now, very exciting, are uh, working with uh, chromium triiodide, which exhibits magnetism, is magnetic with a Curie temperature not very high, 45K. So this is also exact, exciting. I would not cover this in my, in my talk. Okay, let's talk a little bit about electronic properties. It turns out that since 1946, uh, Wallace calculated the band structure of graphene. And he realized, in fact, he his approximation was uh, consider just one layer because the conduction takes place only in the layers. But in fact, there is a little bit of conduction uh, uh, in the C directions, in the perpendicular direction, but certainly he was, he was right. Uh, he use a tight, bind, tight binding approach. And what he found was that the energy was proportional to the momentum. So, but the energy goes linearly with the momentum. So this is a, a energy linear dispersion that you don't see in other materials. What you see is a parabolic uh, relation between the energy and momentum. But in graphene, since 1947, uh, Wallace uh, found this. So this is not new. People knew that the graphene had this linear dispersion, at least theoretically. So the important achievement of Andre Gein and Konstantin Novoselov was that they were able to measure that certainly you have a linear electronic dispersion. And due to these experiments, uh, they got an old price because this linear dispersion had uh, several implications. Uh, electrons behave differently. You don't follow uh, the uh, Schrodinger equation in which you have a parabolic bands. What you follow is the Dirac equation. So your electrons behave as massless Dirac fermions. So, uh, this is really very important um, discovery, and uh, they got the Nobel Prize for this. Okay, so here is just, I'm sure some of you uh, who have taken the course, solid state physics course with me, this is the energy dispersion of graphene. So it's linear dispersion. Uh, it is linear around a, this point, which we call K point, because this is a, a point in one of the, uh, is one of the symmetry points in the Riemann zone. Uh, so at the K point is linear. So this is just one monolayer, one monolayer. As if you put another layer, 
on top, then your dispersion becomes, you have these two bands and your dispersion becomes parabolic and so on. So the monolayer is the important. Having a monolayer is important. However, by layers also may be interesting and I will show you why. This is a calculation I performed uh, using density functional theory with local density approximation, which is the easiest and the fastest. And this is the band structure that you get. Here I have marked with a red circle that around the K point you have a linear dispersion. Outside the K point, then that's not does not happen. So, so here is the band structure. I have also plotted the density of states, which is a, a sometimes important uh, to this is a projected density of states to show us that uh, uh, we can study the how our bands behave. Uh, so here it was done with DFT um, and can be calculated uh, easily. One important message is that, uh, of course, what you need is coordinates to perform this calculation. Now with the materials database, there is also a two-dimensional database, the two-dimensional materials database, you can get the coordinates of uh, all of these materials which on the other hand, it is not difficult to obtain them uh, by hand. Uh, so, okay. This is something, this was a very surprising paper in 2019, last year, which I should have put. And what the group of Pablo, Carillo Herrero, what they found, in fact, there are other groups here, but was that if you have a two layers, by layer graphene, two layers, and then you twist one of the layers by a 1.05 degrees, you change the electronic properties. Now you have the, your by layer, and what you do here is here is the density of states. The Fermi level is here now, it has shifted. Look here the where I have the zero is where my Dirac cone, this by the way is called Dirac cone, is exactly in the middle of these uh, on my, on my of my density of states in the bilayer graphene what i have is that the there is a shift of this zero and at zero now i have a, a states this is not graphene now this is bilayer graphene and this material with this angle uh, exhibits superconductivity. And I have here a, this is not the magic angle of 1.05, but this is to show you that when you rotate one layer over the other one, what you generate is a moiré pattern. I think you can see that this, you have here what it is called a super lattice. And these super lattice, uh, you can calculate the electronic properties. Of course, the super lattice uh, will have lots of atoms, and this, but this can be calculated. So not only the important thing of this paper is that you have superconductivity, but also you can visit other interesting 
properties because the, yeah, the properties you have are not the properties you have in graphene. Your electrons are not Dirac fermions anymore, but you may have a, a different properties like superconductivity, for example. This is a I would say perhaps the first observation of graphene, 1961. So experimentally, not only theoretically, experimentally, uh, people uh, in transmission electron microscopy, since you need to work with very thin samples, people knew that one way to obtain very thin samples was through expo exfoliation. In particular, you can use exfoliation in these structures where you don't have a chemical bond between your layers. Uh, so here in this paper by Bohm and co-workers, they have, they produce a really electron micrographs where you can see that this is really very thin. And here, uh, there should be looks like similar. Of course, the technology has advanced a lot. You know, we have uh, new electron microscopes, but here, there, in this region, there should be uh, graphene and also in this region. So it is not completely new. There is no uh, discovery of graphene. So graphene was known. Uh, the same uh, similar thing happened with uh, molybdenum disulfide. And here in this paper by Frind, uh, he mentioned that, that uh, in order to get this um, molecular layer thick crystal, uh, he prepared this by using adhesive tape. This is called the scotch tape method. But now they have added, I mean, this was called scotch tape method, but now they call it a mechanical exfoliation. Uh, but it's just using a scotch tape in your, and then you repeat this uh, scotch tape treatment until you may have one or two. When do you have one or two layers? I mean, you, what you have is powder and then you, or flakes, which is powdery because are very tiny, then you put this at, at the electron microscope and then you can see that you have graphene. So it's not new. This is another paper in which uh, with molybdenum disulfide, uh, Frind, again, he talks about monolayers and of course, using this scotch tape method. This is 1986. No, I, I advise uh, students to always look at uh, the uh, literature, um, the oldest literature. You may be surprised that we are not inventing, reinventing things. Things were known, but of course they didn't have the technology for uh, studying um, or performing experiments or measurements. Uh, here, what I have done is I have calculated uh, the band structure of a one monolayer of tungsten disulfide and a crystal of tungsten disulfide. What do I mean by a crystal? Crystal is, this is an infinite number. infinite layers. And you can see the difference. I have, these are what is called the uh, high symmetry points. Uh, what we have, these structures, this is not right, because this should be a hexagon.
the brilliant zone is hexagonal, your crystal lattice is hexagonal, and in the reciprocal space, the brilliant zone has points which have a particular name. This is called M, which we have here. This is K, which we have here. And this is gamma, which is the center of the Brillouin zone. And we can see here in the monolayer that this is the valence band. And here we have the conduction band. In fact, all these are conduction bands, and these are all these are valence bands that there is a separation between the valence band and the conduction band. And here, the distance between the highest of the valence band and the lowest of the conduction band is called band gap. And if I have a band gap, then I have a, a semiconductor. And here, when the band gap is direct means that I don't need momentum. So it's just a direct from this point to this point vertically. That's called direct band gap. Uh, in fact, I have used here optical, optical gap. Uh, and I will explain that. And in, in the other case, in the case of bulk, you can see that there is difference once I have put several layers or infinite number of layers, the gap, the shortest distance now is not direct, but I need this momentum distance. So this is called indirect band gap uh, or indirect optical band gap. So optical because we can measure optically and it is not the electronic band gap why because the transition metal dicalcogenides exhibit electron hole pairs which have a considerable energy uh, so that means these excitons have energy and the energy is not small can be a 0.4 electron volts. So, but the interesting thing here is to see the difference between a dire band gap in monolayer and the indirect band gap in bulk. But what happens when we have a bilayer? Here I have the direct band gap of the monolayer, and as soon as I put just similarly to graphene. When I put the other layer on top, my system does not behave. In the case of graphene, my electrons do, do not behave as Dirac fermions. Uh, and in this case, my system does not have the direct band gap that it is important for optical properties. For optical properties, having a direct band gap, it is uh, very important. So if we add a, another layer, so we have three layers, we continue having a, a indirect band gap and the size of the band gap changes. And if we have a four layers, I continue having an indirect, indirect band gap and also when I have the infinite number of layers. So this is, so working with monolayer is important in the case of transition metal dicalcogenides, TMDs. There is, beside excitonic effects, excitons, uh, it is important to mention that uh, these uh, transition metal dicalcogenides exhibit a, what it is called a, a strong a, a, a spin orbit coupling. And a strong exciton binding energies. A strong spin orbit coupling means, and you can calculate this 
uh, using a uh, DFT codes. In this case, I have used uh, a DFT with general gradient approximation, which usually is the one you you should use for uh, calculating this spin orbit coupling. Uh, the spin orbit coupling effect means that uh, the bands, the the generacy of the bands, they split. And they split here, we can see how the bands split. These bands are not splitted here because here I have not included any spin orbit coupling. So when I include the spin orbit coupling, then there is a um, bands split and this splitting in this case is of 0.42 electron volts. So it is not small. And also the exciton binding energy is not small. So if you want to describe properly a transition metal dical cohenides, um, then you have to do a spin orbit up the spin orbit coupling calculations, which take some time, but excitons take a lot of more time. And there is one another point that is important to mention. Uh, is that density functional theory does not give you the correct gap. Uh, you have to use other methods, like a, a, there is one method, GW method, or there are methods in which you just can shift the, the conduction bands. You shift these, all these bands to the value of the um, observe a uh, band gap. Uh, interestingly, uh, when you calculate a spin orbit coupling, what you have is that you have this gap, and this gap is assuming that you use a, a photon and you excite an electron from the balance band to the conduction band. Uh, this uh, electron will uh, form an electron hole pair. Now you have an electron here, you have a hole here. Uh, and when this electron hole pair, this electron recombines, returns to the balance band, uh, also you have a photon. This photon is called a uh, is produced by this A exciton. That's why I have put here A exciton. Uh, due to the spin orbit coupling, we have also what is called the B exciton because it's this transition. When you excite your uh, electron from with this uh, energy, this energy, you have this B exciton, which can be observed. So if you don't use a spin orbit coupling, then you have just one exit. And if you use DFT without the spin orbit coupling, the thing is that you don't have uh, the B exciton, which is important. You don't have the correct band gap and you don't have excitons. So DFT uh, tells you it's just, gives you an, an idea on how things work, but not uh, exactly what is really happening. Uh, this is uh, also uh, interesting to mention here because we will talk a little bit about curvature. Let me see how, how I'm, I'm doing. Uh, perhaps I will go faster, I need to go faster. Uh, this is a calculation that uh, me and colleagues, uh, Gotthard Seifert, uh, did uh, 20 years ago on a tungsten sulfide nanotubes. And what we found was that the zigzag nanotubes, uh, I'm not going to get into the details about what is a zigzag nanotube, but this structure is different. I mean, it's the way how you roll the tube, how you form the tube. And in these zigzag nanotubes, we found that the old zigzag nanotubes 
exhibit a direct band gamma. Of course, we are talking about monolayers. Um, and all the armchair nanotubes had a indirect band gamma. So this was an interesting uh, finding. And at that time, we also found that the monolayer had a direct band gap, but we were not interested in monolayer because uh, topologically it was too simple. Uh, now people are interested in monolayers. I think I will skip this about the uh, methods to obtain this. Uh, perhaps briefly, this is the scotch tape method, uh, mechanical exfoliation, and what people use now because it's very easy to implement in labs, is called chemical vapor deposition. Um, there is another chemical method called chemical vapor transport. And this here is the way uh, you see in optical microscope a monolayer. Here is a monolayer. And when you use exfoliation, you also have uh, uh, more layers. This has more layers. Uh, also, this this piece has more layers. So what you work is with pieces, and with the chemical vapor transport, you have more control, but the quality is not so good. So all this is a um, piece of a two-dimensional material. Okay. Uh, regarding geometrical properties, I will be briefly. I will be brief, and. If you have a surface, a two-dimensional surface, uh, strictly speaking, uh, you can have only three geometries. Uh, spherical geometry, hyperbolic geometry, and Euclidean geometry. And you can bend your structure to have a saddle points like this one. You can have this point which is called elliptical points and you also uh, can roll for example you can roll a, a sheet of graphene to form a carbon nanotube and you have a point like this one uh, there is one in differential geometry a uh, uh, it's more like it's a definition because uh, is the product in two dimensions a surface has two principal curvatures these are the principal curvatures which and the principal curvatures their vectors are orthogonal so if i vector in this direction vector in this direction this is 90 degrees uh, the product of the two principal curvatures is called Gaussian curvature. And the average of the two principal curvatures is called mean curvature. So if you are able, you should be able, at least in theory, to introduce in two-dimensional materials curvature. But how to do it? Uh, well, you can do it through defects, um, which I will show. This is what I was mentioning, the three, three different, different geometries in three three-dimensional space, Euclidean, spherical, and hyperbolic. So let's talk about graphene. Uh, I have to mention before talking about graphene that nature uses these uh, different geometries in three dimensions, Euclidean, hyperbolic, and uh, spherical or uh, elliptical um, in, in at different levels of complexity. These, for example, the skeleton of an echinoderm when all the uh, soft matter has died so these holes are left and this surface you have is made of a uh, saddle points almost everywhere uh, in water lipid surfactant systems you can have these micelles which can be spherical 
here, different types of micelles. Uh, and also you can have these geometries which exhibit a negative Gaussian curvature, so hyperbolic geometry, and also you can have that the uh, amphifields that compose these uh, mixtures and also compose the uh, uh, our cells, the exterior shell of our cells is made of phospholipids. Uh, which are more or less arranged in, in this way. Uh, but also you can have uh, layers. So at different levels of complexity. This is, for example, the scanning electron micrograph of the eye of an insect. This is a bee. And you can see the hexagons. Of course, with hexagons, you can feel the plane up to infinity, but the eyes of the bees are not infinite. So at the edge of the eye, what you have is these defects. These don't look like hexagons, but distorted hexagons and pentagons, which are needed to bend the eye of the insect. In the same way, we can introduce pentagons to bend graphene, here is one pentagon, and if you introduce 20, uh, sorry, 12 pentagons, what you have is a C60. This is a molecule uh, of 60 carbon atoms, uh, and the people who discovered this molecule by, uh, or synthesized this molecule got the Nobel Prize in 1996. You also can have carbon nanotubes as elongated structures, which in which the curvature here is uh, due to the introduction of pentagonal rings, the ones we have, which, by the way, C60 is a soccer ball. Uh, the structure and the symmetry of C60 is uh, uh, icosahedral symmetry, the same symmetry as the icosahedron. So you can bend. Uh, this is an example of how graphene could be bent, but the conditions are different. And of course, you can have uh, a bigger family of fullerenes, which exhibits 12 pentagons. You should have 12 pentagons to have the right uh, deficit of a sphere. And you can add number of hexagons you want. Uh, and here we have C70, which also has been found, C240 which is icosahedral and has not been found, is a big, big fullerene. But there are other onion-like structures that have been found. So that's also interesting. Um, these are Professor Rick Smalley, uh, Professor uh, Robert Curl, and Professor Harold Croto, who got the Nobel Prize in 1990. Uh, six. This photograph was taken in 1985, though most of the work, experimental work, was done by uh, Sean O'Brien and Jim Heath. Uh, they didn't get, uh, they just got the acknowledgement. Uh, because the Nobel Prize only can be given to three. Okay, uh, I just will mention that uh, tungsten disulfide, a layer material, can also form nanotubes. And these are examples. Here is the, the distance between these layers is around six angstroms. And nanotubes, these nanotubes can be acquired curvature in, at the tips. There are other tips that are open. Um, uh, I will not talk uh, about the mathematical problem of periodic minimal surfaces in depth, but uh, I can say that a minimal surface is a zero mean curvature surface at every point. You have zero mean curvature. Uh, that means 
that the average of the um, of the uh, principal curvature is zero everywhere. So you have uh, your structure is made of saddle points. And uh, Herman Amandu Schwartz uh, studied in his thesis uh, periodic minimal surfaces mathematically. He was a student of Weierstrass, Karl Weierstrass, a German mathematician. So what uh, he found was, in fact, what I have here is a Poincaré disk to show that it is possible to have, at least in the Poincaré disk, a surface which interior angles, here are the interior angles of my triangle, because this is a triangle, uh, at less than 180 degrees. In this case, is 165 degrees. Uh, I cannot embed I mean, I cannot put this surface in three dimensions without having self-intersections. But because here, the Gaussian curvature is minus one at every point. But what I can do is distort the structure in a way, or a stretch and distort the structure in a way, preserving the angles, and I can have a hyperbolic surface that can be embedded in three dimensions. And it turns out that this hyperbolic surface can have zero mean curvature at every point. That means can have, can be a minimal surface. And here, this is the triangle now in three dimensions in real space, not in the Poincaré space. This is this triangle is being modified, but the angles are the same, 35, 45, and 90. Sorry, 30, 45, and 90. So, and we can use this triangle um, to build a periodic structure. And this is the periodic structure. The triangle is here. And this is called the P surface, which was found by Bayer Strass at the end of the 19th century. And interestingly, uh, these surfaces divide the space into two regions. You have the, this region and this region, the inside and the outside. So this is interesting. Uh, this is another surface called the G surface or gyroid. So all these are minimal surfaces. And um, one of uh, my contributions um, with Professor Alan Mackay was to introduce, to decorate the surface with carbon atoms. We did this in 1991. And what we did was Instead of introducing pentagonal rings, we introduce octagonal rings here. And if you introduce octagonal rings in a, a honeycomb, you can get, you can decorate a periodic minimal surfaces. So this was, a, uh, this is a more recent paper uh, written with a undergrad student, uh, David Miller, in which we calculated the mechanical properties of giant, because now this one, you can see the graphitic mesh. These, uh, by the way, these structures with negative Gaussian curvature are called Schwarzites in, in honor, to honor Hermann Amandu Schwartz was the first who proposed them. So with David Miller, what we did was to study giant structures. So these ones have lots of atoms. And then you have the octagon here. Here you have the octagon here. And to calculate the properties, of course, 
you cannot do use the DFT uh, because you have too many atoms. Uh, we were not interested in the electronic properties. We were interested more in the mechanical properties. So we found that these structures uh, were mechanically stable in a paper. So there are, and we characterize this mathematically. Uh, one interesting thing is uh, if you don't use DFT for these uh, uh, calculations, then what we use was molecular dynamics on in this particular uh, uh, relaxation um, we use the um, metropolis algorithm which uh, people call monte carlo but it's called this uh, metropolis to relax the structures with a, a potential a empirical potential which is uh, this type of potential type of uh, you can use tensor or um, I think tensor is the easiest one um, so if you this is the minimal surface if you relax the minimal surface using the tensor potential for graphite, you can see that the structure becomes flat because graphene likes to be flat. Graphene does not like to have a mean curvature, zero mean curvature everywhere. Graphene likes to be flat. That's why we have this is an important change due to relaxation. However, the topology does not change. We also find some interesting ripples when you relax that we mentioned we studied in this paper. Uh, let me see how much time I have. Uh, I have like, uh, how much time do I have, uh, Paul? Okay, I think I have. Uh, on 20 minutes. So you can introduce defects in these structures. Ah, okay. 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay. So I will move because these structures with negative curvature, for example, this one, um, if you, this one does not, is not as big as the ones we studied with. Uh, um, David Miller, and this structure can be studied with density functional theory using the code siesta. And what we found was that there are Dirac cones, but the Dirac cones are not at the Fermi level, like in graphene. So we published this. Here, this is another cone. And what uh, we proposed at that time was to introduce lithium to shift the Fermi level. And here we have that lithium was close, could do the trick. So that was an interesting finding. Um, also with Professor Vincent Menier, and his student uh, Owens, we found all these Dirac cones in different. Uh, this was with DFT uh, using VASP um, and using a supercomputer, and we found found all these Dirac cones in these three-dimensional structures. So these are hyper Dirac cones. Um, so we can form several structures out of a two-dimensional system like fullerenes like cones like toroids of course some of them are hypothetical tubes ribbons uh, helicoids um, we can have these are called hekelites i will not talk about them are very interesting 
graphene, we can have graphite, we can have schwarzites. Uh, here, uh, we can connect two layers with holes, or we can have some this hyper graphene made out of carbon nanotubes. Of course, some of them are hypothetical. So, um, this is just to show you that in uh, transition metal dichalcogenides, we can introduce defects of this type to introduce, to generate the uh, positive curvature that you need to close the structure, like the pentagon to close and form a fullerene. And you need this octagonal-like defect to generate negative Gaussian uh, or negative curvature in your uh, TMD. And people have found that these structures are found, can be found in a uh, grain boundaries, uh, in which these are extended line of defects. And this has been recently found. So let's go to quickly uh, uh, vibrational properties. So it turns out that you can calculate the vibrational properties using density functional theory, which once you calculate the vibrational properties through the uh, phonon dispersion, as we have seen the electronic dispersion, which is linear in graphing, uh, with DFT, we can calculate the phonon dispersions. These phonons are um, uh, excitations, are quantized vibrations. So uh, I will skip this. This is interesting, but I need to skip. Uh, I skip. Uh, these quantized vibrations are uh, closely related because uh, Raman uh, spectroscopy is you can uh, detect some of these vibrations, these collective excitations of your lattice. With infrared spectroscopy, you get other vibrations, the ones that are not uh, Raman active. So uh, here is Raman when he got the Nobel Prize because of this uh, Raman effect. And what you do is you shine a laser or monochromatic light uh, and your most of your um, I mean your material, most of the I mean the response will be that you shine a laser and what you get is exactly uh, the same. The scattering you get is the same wavelength as you used. Uh, however, there it, it happens that when you uh, excite, uh, your scattering is not exact the same wavelength. And then you have this shift, this difference. And this difference tells you about the uh, uh, Raman, uh, about the vibrations of your system. Um, so here, this is to show you, uh, this is the phonon dispersion. What I have here is the phonon dispersion calculated with DFT, LDA. In fact, I recommend to do uh, phonon dispersions with LDA. It is faster. Uh, here we have the three acoustical modes longitudinal, transverse, and zero acoustic modes, vibrations. And this one is not Raman active. And this one, it is active around 1600. This 1600 mode corresponds to what people call the G, G band in uh, Raman spectroscopy. The D band, which is associated with defects, is a around here. 
in around 1300. And this is a different process. It's not a first order process. Usually what we have in Raman spectroscopy at gamma, the uh, Raman active modes, and this is one can see which ones are Raman active by looking at the symmetry, uh, are the modes that you will observe in your, uh, uh, well, you also, sorry, are the modes that uh, you find in your spectrum. This is, you find this one. This one is not a first order mode. It's called the D band and is due to defects. And so you can use, you can study different orders, uh, but uh, all the information is given in your, of the possible vibrations or the possible values you can have in your uh, Raman spectrum in this graph in the phonon dispersion. Uh, to calculate or compute um, resonance processes is more complicated. It's more complicated. And I have a reference here. I will skip this one. I will not talk about um, um, this is a reference that you can see because in this paper we calculated a resonance, a double resonance of a TMD of a transition metal dichalcogenide using what is called the generalized Fermi golden rule. Um, I will skip, I will just briefly talk about a linear and nonlinear optical properties. One of the important uh, issues or characteristics of uh, TMDs, molybdenum sulfide, molybdenum diselenide, the ones that are semiconducting, is that they do not have inversion symmetry. So no inversion. No inversion symmetry. And this means that you can have nonlinear optical properties. When you have a linear optical susceptibility, susceptibility this is the uh, relationship of the uh, polarization. But you can, when you have no inversion symmetry, you can express the polarization in this way, in which you have the linear part, chi one, uh, but you have chi two, and you have chi three, and this appears appear when you don't have inversion symmetry. In fact, chi three appears also when you have inversion, but chi two not, and chi two is related to what it is called second harmonic generation. So second harmonic generation you know, can be found, it is found in TMDs. This is a second harmonic generation image of molybdenum disulfide. So you can have an image using the second harmonic the, the generation, the nonlinear optical properties. And here you see that this is black because in these points, at these points, a bilayer is growing. So it does not shine. Um, just very quickly, I will mention that uh, if you have one of the uses of second harmonic is you have here a second harmonic uh, generation crystal. You shine a laser with 800 nanometers and you get a laser with a different color. In this case it was a red color, you get sort of blue color due to the second harmonic generation. Uh, and for calculating second harmonic generation, uh, you can have I took this from a uh, Corey's thesis, uh, you can have you can use a code called Avinit. Avinit does not include excitons. It gives you an idea, but you can use lumen, and you lumen uses solves the Bethe-Salpeter equation. In fact, this is a time-dependent density functional theory, 
And the Bert Salpeter equation is a green function description of a two body particle. Why two body particle? Because we have electrons and we have an electron and a hole, we have an exciton. So these calculation take, uh, calculations take a lot of time. Uh, this one more, but Corey managed to uh, perform these calculations with Corey and uh, Michael looking. And what we found is that we calculated second harmonic generation, not only for TMDs, which have a very uh, huge uh, second harmonic uh, generation uh, intensity, but also for alloys. And the latest result was, uh, is this in which a, a paper uh, of uh, Corey, we produced this year, in which he using second harmonic generation, uh, he characterizes the different transitions associ associated with the different excitons. So then I will finish my, my talk. And if there are questions, I will be happy. Um, I should have uh, gone faster, but uh, this is what I have. Uh, thank you very much. I have a quick question. Yes. Um, in the very beginning, about how you talked about the rotation of the uh, two, uh, the bilayer graphene. Yes. Um, how do you how do you go about doing that, and how do you go about accurately getting a good rotation from one layer to another? Now, uh, experimentalists, uh, because uh, theoretically you can do it very easily. Uh, experimentalists, they have managed now to twist almost the angle they want. And they do this with uh, not only graphing, but also people are working with also with TMDs. This is more a experimental uh, technique, uh, but I know they have a very good control. That's why they found these. I see. So they can put it down to a good degree of accuracy. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. Another question?